Growing Growing Pains. Growing Pains. Growing Pains. Growing Pains. Welcome to Growing Pains. We have been having conversations from the moment we could speak as human beings. When you think about how quickly we pick up words as infants and how quickly we turn those words into sentences and interact with our parents or our guardians or our elders or our siblings, having conversations is just a part of being a human being. What I have found in my 38 years of life is that conversations can be really tricky and having good conversations is such an important part of life as we navigate from those early days of being a child, being at school, being in you know, sporting groups or activity groups and in families and navigating what that looks like to have a conversation and a good conversation then. And taking all of those learnings and influences and what we have seen modelled and starting to form our own opinions, starting to have our own beliefs, starting to navigate the world as a young adult and in turn navigate the challenges of having better conversations. It's one thing to be able to just have a conversation with someone and to state your opinions or state your facts or state what your emotions are or what is happening for you. But listening forms such a big part of that as well and that that to and fro, that that dance that is a good conversation is really, really important and is 100% a skill that I, I think that we're all constantly adjusting and trying to be better at. So it ties in so well with today's episode where I have the pleasure of speaking to not one, but not two, but three incredible women uh, and they are working together as a collective and making some real change in the world, becoming better together. So in today's episode, I'll be speaking with Chantal Thompson, Gemma Saunders and Lillian Kikuvi. They are the powerhouse women behind the Becoming Better Together Collective. They believe that once we know ourselves, our context and each other better, we can do better together in a culture first decade. That is why the collective's vision is Becoming Better Together. The Becoming Better Together program is a bespoke program aimed at addressing this question, how might we create a culture of belonging and respect by having vital, authentic and brave conversations about diversity, equity and inclusion in order to become better together. So who are these three women? Chantelle is a proud Bakenji Ningpa European woman and a mother of three children, including twins. Chantelle has gone on to win three world titles in jiu-jitsu, all in her 30s, made bid for the 2016 Olympics in freestyle wrestling, was selected as an ambassador for the GC 2018 Commonwealth Games and made it onto the Australian wrestling shadow team for the GC 2018 Games, all whilst managing a family of three. Now, I'm mindful that um, I'm reading this right now, but Chantelle has actually clarified that she is a mother of five. So my apologies, she is a mother of five. Now, she managed all of this while managing her family, working and earning a double degree in teaching and arts, postgraduate certificate in Indigenous trauma and recovery, and starting her own business. Chantelle is a strong advocate for equality, human rights, and fighting for what is right. Gemma is a proud queer woman and a mother of two. Gemma has almost two decades of experience in human resource spanning talent acquisition, diversity and inclusion, employee experience, organisational development, leadership development and organisational change. Gemma is a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and a director on the board of Minus 18, Australia's leading youth LGBTQIA plus charity fighting homophobia, biophobia, transphobia and interphobia. 
listed in Human Resources Director's Hot List and nominated in the Diversity Champion and Inspirational Role Models categories at the Australian LGBTI Awards. Gemma is known as a bold, authentic and progressive leader. Lillian Kukuvi is a diversity and inclusion evangelist obsessed with helping individuals and organisations harness the extraordinary power of diversity and inclusion. Lillian is a Kenyan Australian who uses her African tribal framework to deliver solutions to clients that include Fidelity International, Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, Ronald McDonald House Charities, Medibank, Open Universities, Western Bulldogs AFL Club, Melton City Council and Parkville Juvenile Correction Centre. Lillian has over 15 years corporate experience and has worked with clients in the public, private and not-for-profit sectors. An advisory board member of Culturally Diverse Women, she has helped to leadership roles in companies like Medibank, WorkSafe Australia and Employers Mutual Limited. So let's dive in as we explore with these incredible women how to have better conversations. Well, I am incredibly privileged to be sitting with not one, not two, but three incredible women today. So I would love to welcome Chantel, Lillian and Gemma to the podcast of Growing Pains. Thank you so much, ladies, for being with me today and being with our listeners. Now, Chantel, before we get stuck in, I am going to throw to you um, and uh, ask of you to uh, do an acknowledgement of country for us. Uh, thank you, Caroline, and thank you for having us all on the podcast today. I would like to begin by not only acknowledging but welcoming you all to this time and space as a Barkindji Nipa European woman of descent. I'm currently residing on Lachi Lachi and bordering on Barkindji country, so as a Barkindji woman, I can welcome you to this time and space and pay my respects to our elders, both past and present, and I also acknowledge and pay my respects to all First Nations people, ancestors and elders across Australia. And I think this is even more important today because it's the 27th of May. Yesterday was National Sorry Day and today is the beginning of Reconciliation Week. And for a lot of First Nations people, it's a really heavy time uh, sitting and acknowledging our shared history, the complexities of that. So in that vein, I acknowledge my ancestors and I say sorry to my ancestors for everything they experienced and I acknowledge the work that we are doing through these platforms and together to create change across Australia. And I hope that everyone listening today really takes the time to listen deeply with an open heart to everything we're going to share today because it's going to be amazing. Uh, thank you for not only um, you know, doing that acknowledgement for us, but, but also sharing some of your personal insights and even your personal thoughts on this point in time where though the overarching discussion of this podcast is growing pains and the challenges of being a, an adult and a young adult, um, which is what we're hoping our listeners will gain from the conversations we have over these episodes, I am really conscious that we can all do so much better every day um, and I think that in itself is going to lend itself really well to what we'll be talking today about. So today we are talking about having better conversations and just to loosen us up a little bit, I am going to start with some rapid fire questions. Now, these are the only questions that you have not seen. There's not too many of them. I was conscious that I'm doing rapid fire with three people today. So that in itself could be a whole nother podcast episode. But I'll start with you, Chantel. Um, do you consider yourself to be a grown up adult? Yes and no. <laughs> and I think to your 
Um, first point about being a podcast around growing pains. I think we have growing pains as a country. And mm. um, Australia as a current concept is only 230 years old, whereas Aboriginal culture, First Nations people have been here since the beginning of time and have a documented history of 80,000 years plus. So when you compare the two, it's like having your thousandth generation grandparent come back to to sit with you with a preteen in in that concept. So I think it's a perfect platform as a parent, as a woman who's in business, as a woman trying to navigate so many different roles and places, I think there's certain aspects where I feel like an adult and then there's certain other things where I feel like I'm still open to to learning and, and making mistakes and still figuring it out. Sometimes I go, oh, yeah, I'm a 38. I'm almost 40. Like, what the heck? Why am I still thinking like that and needing like I need to seek permission? <laughs> Oh, it's so true. I'm 38 as well, and I very much understand what you mean, <laughs> and a mother as well. Lillian, what about you? Do you consider yourself to be a grown-up adult? No. <laughs> just uh, flat out. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, just, no. I'm just thinking, you know, what is a grown-up adult? Like, who, who, who makes those rules? Who defines mm. this? For me, in this season, I feel that... I have everything that I have to make responsible choices um, as a businesswoman, as a sister, as a friend, as a colleague. So with regards to, from a societal point of view, being able to manage responsibilities, yes, I, I, I would say I'm a grown adult, but what, what is a grown adult? What is, is, that? is What is it? So I consider myself as somebody that is constant, constantly evolving. And because of that, that means I'm growing all the time. I'm growing up all the time, showing up every season, every situation, every context. So I can't say I'm grown. I am growing. That's why I say no, because I, I'm, I'm not a grown adult. No, I've got a lot of evolution. I like yeah. it. All right, Gemma, where do you sit in the, are you just in the middle or where are you? I think I'm a fully grown adult in what society wants me to be, but I'm trying not to be an adult actually because <laughs> um, I think that there's – I think I grew up so quickly and so fast. I was the oldest sibling and um, had a lot of responsibility and um, had to do a lot of growing fast. And I think that um, what I'm trying to learn to do now is to let go of that and to just be playful and to be in the moment and to experience joy and curiosity and some of the things that I think I would have fast-tracked when I was younger in the, an attempt to grow up quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm realising there's so much joy in just being and playing and experiencing things from a curious angle um, and, you know, this adulting of knowing stuff um, yeah, it's better to be a learner than a knower. So I'm trying to shake off the mm. grown up stuff and be more playful, actually. But I think in terms of societal boxes, I probably tick most things in a sensible yeah. way. But sensible isn't really serving me anymore. So I'm starting to <laughs> shake off the politeness and the grown up. Oh, that's so you've all touched on so many factors that we believe to be, you know, being an adult. But I will continue with my rapid fire questions it's really hard to do rapid fire with three answers by the way but we'll get there um Chantel what is what can you tell us and choose to share with us as your most embarrassing adult fail see the other two are like looking at me like oh I've got time to think about this that's why it's not rapid fire yeah. even it's rapid fire because I'll have to switch it around because it's not fair like you get put mm -hmm. on the spot everyone else is like I can see their thinking faces but go yeah. tell us tell us the, uh, the adult fail I don't know I I can't think of anything that's like embarrassing as such but I think um Trying to have an online presence and have, I guess, some sort of level of 
uh, influence and a brand and then having a very big family. So I'm the third eldest of 18 and I'm like Gemma. I had to grow up really quickly and um, and I really love what Gemma said about both Lillian and Gemma about just being more playful and kind of just letting things go and, and following the seasons. But whenever I think about if I got onto a really big platform, what that would mean around my family and my siblings because some of my siblings can be really embarrassing and <laughs> – they sit there actually like things, they'll bring up things like, oh, my sister's a three-time world champion, but one time we're at our auntie's house and we were wrestling and she got taken down by her younger brother and knocked a hole in the wall, didn't uh, didn't choose to admit that it was her, and then her younger, younger siblings got in trouble for it for about five years until it was found out later that it was actually the the wrestler in the family and the older brother that were actually the ones putting holes in walls. So mm-hmm. it would be, be those sort of things, not taking responsibility when you should. Uh, so it would be things from your childhood or younger life that would come to haunt you and embarrass yeah, you as an adult. Pretty much, Fair yeah. Enough. And having the siblings do the pleasure for you because they're like, oh, you think you're a <laughs> big dog. We're going to bring you down a peg or two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. What about you, Lillian? Can you think of an adult fail or an embarrassing adult moment? Um, I've got a number of adult fails. Um, <clears throat> I guess the, what, what comes to mind being in the di- digital age is, um, you know, being part of so many groups. So if you think about WhatsApp, we've got a WhatsApp group for everything. WhatsApp group for doing, WhatsApp group for the family, WhatsApp group for life. And sometimes uh, you get the WhatsApp groups or the groups. I was confused. <laughs> and you send the wrong message to the wrong pla- platform. And um, I've happened to do that. So I've, I've, I've happened to do that a few, a, a few times. And um, that would be the most embarrassing. So what I've come to learn is just be a little bit more careful. Be aware of the group's name. Don't send messages at particular times. <laughs> Just be conscious about the content. Um, so I would say that would be the that would be the most embarrassing thing that comes to mind as an adult. I can. Everyone has had that moment. Be it even in a text to one person, let alone to a whole WhatsApp group. So yeah, that's that's a good one. What about you, Gemma? Oh, well, what I've realised as an adult is that embarrassment is actually healthy because it's fleeting. It mm-hmm. comes and it goes. And I think when you start to take on the idea of shame um, that becomes a whole different story so I think you can mm-hmm. actually appreciate embarrassment in a different way because it is yeah, when you're older, it comes and goes um, whereas I think when I was yeah when I was younger I definitely would have let that embarrassment turn into shame quite quickly but um, mm-hmm. just as one example when I was in the corporate world they did this uh, team event for the corporate like games, like this um, sporting event. I am the least sporting person. Um, I really enjoy a dance to like Lizzo and Baker Boy, like in my kitchen with my kids, but I am not really like, you know, an athlete. And they encouraged me to get involved. And I said, why not? Like, I'll give anything a go. And so I did the corporate triathlon, which was a swim through Sydney Harbour. And I couldn't really swim. So I did it as backstroke. And, <laughs> and the, the category oh, after me. Backstroke. I tried to do it by backstroke because it was the only thing I was comfortable with. And then the group after me had to start while I was still in the water because I was slow. And then they even overtook me. And then I went to do this cycle and my friend was just laughing at me. And I was thinking, that's really rude, Zoe. Why are you laughing at me? And she said, Gemma, you've got your bike helmet on back to front. (laughs) So it was just like a series of embarrassments and I crossed the line after the run. I wanted to throw up, but the most memorable moment was I had just such a beautiful brunch after overlooking the harbour. So Mm -hmm. everything is fleeting and everything's about perspective. That is so true. But in those moments, you're like, oh, everyone's looking at me. (laughs) Um, And are the sharks going to get me? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a whole nother conversation. That's mm. a different podcast. <laughs> so, Chantelle, um, who is a more grown-up adult or more adult to adult that you rely on? I think it depends on the season and the situation. But for me, my 14-year-old daughter is is one of those people because – when you're raising a child and you're trying to break intergenerational lines of trauma, you're trying to handle your own 
bullshit so that your children don't become victims of your trauma and your circumstances. That to me is where the hard work is. And sometimes she'll come out with real levels of maturity and she'll challenge me and she'll, she'll call me out on my hypocrisy or she'll challenge me. And I've always said to my kids, as I, particularly the oldest one, as I parent her at 14, I'm celebrating 14 years of being a parent. Um, mm. Yeah. So so for her and to give her the space to acknowledge when she's right as well is really important for me because she's actually really wise and she's been through her own stuff and she brings her own experiences to the table. Like particularly when I'm doing podcasts or pub, she'll come and help me at events and she's like, mum, you were going off on a tangent here or and people loved it. Like people give me the great feedback. Yeah. And she, and she goes, yeah. mum, it's important for me to give you the real feedback because then yeah. you're going to keep growing. And it's, yeah, so that's that's one thing. And I think learning from my children is a really important aspect of um, acknowledging where I'm at in the seasons and where they're at. But also my grandmother and my ancestors, I look a lot to my spirituality and connecting to my ancestors and trusting the wisdom that comes to me. But my grandmother was always one as well because she um, married my grandfather straight out of a convalescent home. He was a prisoner of war. And she was at a time where she was not only raising a family, she was helping manage a family business, but she also went off and got another side job as well as a cleaner at a school and worked in those hours just so she would have her own money separate to that of her husband and not being reliant on her husband and my oldest uncle because at that time, like, all the money obviously was going towards wherever the husband wanted it to go. So it's very much about um, holding those different spaces. But it's nice to always have someone who's who's more responsible or knowledgeable than yourself in situations. <laughs> I love that. I love that you can pull from both, you know, but from both directions as such. Um, amazing. Lillian, who's the more adult adult in your life? Who do you turn to? Um, definitely my mother. Uh, she is a, a massive inspiration to me. Uh, I have seen, uh, a human being become better every time, every season. She has just shown up from day one. Uh, she was born in a slum in Kenya, and that's where I'm from originally. Uh, she didn't have a lot of education. She found a way to get uh, qualifications um, in, I think it was a secretarial course that they used to do in Kenya at that time. She got her papers, secured a job in the government department, and made her way to um the minister's office just built a career for herself, went into the corporate world, built a HR career for, for herself and was very successful and, and got outside of that space, the corporate world and mm. own business and was able to get a master's. Uh, I think she was the only, the first one in her family to get a master's um, at the age of 50 and open mm. her own psych practice. And she has been practicing for over 15 years. And wow. yes, and a couple of years ago, she was like, you know what, Lillian, I feel like life has just begun for me. I, I have a PhD. And I'm like, wow, mom, of course, you can do a PhD mm-hmm. when you have your back. And she decided not to take that route. She's mm-hmm. up um, doing theology studies. And the yeah. last couple of years, actually last year, she uh, became a pastor. So she's been pastoring this church virtually. Uh, thanks to COVID and, um, mm. it's amazing. So she's, she's the adult in my life that I look up to because she's, um, she's challenged gender norms in a patriarchal society. I've seen a, a woman who is very influential. I've seen a woman that is inspirational. I've seen a woman who that is very authentic and just shows up and, and, and is ready to tackle life and give her up the best, best. I've seen a woman who is a role model without even trying, and she's been been very impactful not only to us as you know children. So I've got three younger younger siblings. Um, she's been very impactful to other people in the community. So she's an adult that I consider in my life. And I've, sounds like a real grown up adult. Yeah, like, she grown-up. really sounds like she knows what she's doing. But the yeah. fact that she's still learning is amazing. So yes, absolutely. Ah, Gemma. Who's the adult you turn to? 
Definitely my wife, um, because um, I am the kind of creative. I love that. I love that so much. <laughs> I, I have to turn to my wife because I am kind of a bit of a free, um, you know, bit of a free bird and just, you know, very happy to go with the flow. And um, that means that I never know when bills need to be paid and like, you know, kind of forget some of those really fundamental life things. So um, I'm really happy that um, I've got someone who has strengths and wants to do that kind of house admin. And then the stuff that I get to do is like, planning the we've got a caravan and we go off on like different caravan trips so I get to do all the planning around our adventures and then my wife kind of is the very sensible pragmatic one so I think we can get to play to strengths but I think to Chantelle's point um about you know your daughter Chantelle and like I've got a almost seven year old and I think there's also so much to learn from younger people as well Mm -hmm. um, because they just have this ability to hold a mirror up to us um, about what's important and um, help us reflect on whether we're in our values or not and just get us to sort of, I guess, reflect and check in with ourselves when life's going so quickly around us. So I would say it's also checking in with him and then that adult pragmatic <laughs> life stuff with my wife. So, yeah, I think it's good to have people that can hold you and that, you know, you can play to strengths around you and whether that's your family or community Um, And whatever that looks like, you don't have to be at all. You know, you can have your own strengths and, you know, come together with others and get it done together. Yeah, so true. I'm a parent myself, so I very much understand where you're coming from. It's the mirroring. They mirror the things they can see in us and and they tell it how it is. There's not much of a filter there. (laughs) So my last question for what is not very rapid but fire Um it's a bit of a quirky one. Chantelle, if you, if someone was to play you in a movie of you and your life, who would you choose as an actor, actor, actress, um, to play you today, the age you are today, and then to play you at, like, in your 60s? See, they're both looking at me now oh. going, oh, I can think about this. Poor Chantelle, I've put her on the spot again. You are the only one technically doing rapid fire. I... I'm not really good with remembering people's names. Um, you can just tell me, oh, that woman that, or that person or the guy. So Angelina Jolly comes to, to mind. Angelina Jolly comes to mind now, I think, because of yeah. her. Or Sandra Bullock, like those two are the ones that come to mm-hmm. mind for playing now. Yeah. I think as an older female, um, oh, she's the older lady that's, oh, um, she sometimes does the action movie. She's out of that red, um, uh, and she's uh, in uh, Helen Mirren. Helen, Helen Mirren. Mirren. That's the one. Mm. I think Helen Mirren would be the one that I would pick to play me as an older female because as I'm getting older and I feel like I'm shedding a lot of stuff that just doesn't need to be there because I tend to seek out older women, um, one, because of attachment disorder in terms of not having had um, my mum around when I was younger and stuff like that, but also – wanting to learn from others and looking for women who are 10 to 15 years in front of me going, what were you doing at my age? So then I get a realistic perspective of people going, oh, I'm trying to be them now when at the same age they were, they were having similar struggles. Yeah. What would they do differently and um, what, was their, what was their greater success sort of thing so that I can try and learn from their mistakes now and make different ones. So, um, yeah, and I'm, I'm, they're going to be yours. Yeah, and I think I'm learning to just not care as much about things and be, um, but also at the same time learning to be more subtle and strategic, which is not a key strength of mine um, as, as a younger age. I feel like I'm becoming more refined and elegant, but I've still got that ability to just drive the point straight down when I need to. Mm. Helen Mirren would be able to do that. She's very good. Lillian, who? Tell us who. You today and you and your sister. I seriously, I've just had a mind. The brain's gone blank. I've literally yes, just got a rapid fire question that's supposed to be a rapid fire question. Yeah, um, let me think about that. Gemma, do, are you ready to answer Ooh. this question? As the- oh, Gemma's ready. All right. Yep. Uh, I've. Yeah. Thanks, Lillian. I've gone to kind of like very typical queer icon world um, here. So I think I would have Sarah Paulson um, of the, you know, Ratchet and American Horror Story 
outside mm-hmm. me now. I think that she just captures quirkiness and intensity and lightness <laughs> in a way that I'm just not very one note. So I would choose her. And I reckon um, as I'm older, like maybe Lily Tomlin, <laughs> again, just like qu- quirky or like even Jane Fonda. Like but yeah. Even, even kind of Jane Fonda, um, maybe. Mm, yep. um, but yeah, Lily Tomlin, I think um, if you haven't seen Frankie and Grace on Netflix, definitely um, watch that. Oh, uh, okay. Now I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yep, yeah. Yep, so, yeah, uh, I totally get that. Me as I'm uh, in my 60s for sure. <laughs> Just need the right, quirkiness. <laughs> I think Lillian's got it. Um, I would choose uh, Lupita Nyongo. Uh, Oh, such a good choice. She is, she is, I, I align with obviously her being Kenyan. There's no bias there, but, uh, the fact that she really embraces her cultural heritage and has stepped on the international stage and showcased that without compromising, um, who she is, where she comes from. Um, I love her grace. Uh, I love her family values. I love her humility. So they're things that I connect with when it, when mm. I look at her. Um, in the future, probably somebody like Angela Bassett, um, is, she's just gracious and, um, she's been able to have a, a very successful and long career and, I, she, she seems to understand the concept of, you know, being a woman of color and, and showing up and doing that consistently and offering value and role modeling. Uh, so for me, I look at her as, as, as someone that could play me in the future, somebody that I aspire to, to be. I love that. Thank you. Thank you all for for sharing all of your answers to my, well, some obvious questions because we're talking about growing pains and becoming adults, but I had to throw in a, a bit of a quirky one at the end just to kind of see, see if I could scratch past the surface of what I can see in, you know, across this tiny screen as I'm sharing your, a little bit about you with our audience and our listeners. So growing pains, we... We all have them. We're still having them. I'm not done yet. I think I'll still have them till my last breath. Um, but one of the things that we're going to dive into today is, is this thing called conversations. We're having one now. Um, I always say to my guests of any of the podcasts I do before we start recording that I don't censor anyone. So, um, that to me is a big part of conversations. It's, um, having the flow having a safe space to share whatever comes to mind, being respect, respectful of what you share in that space. Um, now, any of you are welcome to jump in and, and answer this, maybe not all at once because that could be a audible nightmare for our producer who's going to have to put all this together. <laughs> but, um, you know, you've all come from different backgrounds and you're now forming this alliance with the focus of making change for the better for all of us to be better together. So when you think of your experiences as a young adult, what do you believe was the moment that really shaped you into who you are today? There may not actually just be one, but there may be one that comes to mind. Such an interesting um, question, and it's one that we um, we often use in our program, actually, Caroline, because um, part of the work we do is to try and help people understand their own stories because we rarely mm. pause to understand who we are um, before we can be in community with others. And so one of the questions we often ask is, um, you know, what are some of the moments that really shaped you? Um, I don't think I have um, really one big moment, but for me it was a series of moments. I think – that idea of um, having quite a lot of responsibility quite young, being the oldest child. Um, my mum went through – my mum was 17 when she had me. Um, mm. And so I felt like even in our household, you know, there was just more that sense of pulling together um, and jobs that had to be done as a family. And my mum was a single parent for most of 
um, our lives growing up with three kids. And so I think that just the sense of responsibility that comes quite young um, was a moment that shaped me. Um, you know, I used to babysit before it was like you were really even allowed to babysit <laughs> probably um, without any other adult supervisors there. Um, mm. Yeah, I know how to change a nappy and feed a child when I was eight years old. Like it's just mm. part of mm. what happened. So I think that they're some of the moments that shaped me in, sen- in a sense of responsibility and the care and generosity that I offer to others. Um, and I think yeah. the other that I talk about in our program when I share my story, the two others are really um, my relationship with my my granddad, who um, didn't really have a lot of money, came from a very, very poor background, um, but had a huge amount of love and humour and was always telling jokes, creating fun environments. He had a drawer in his house with fake noses and balloons he used to blow up and, um, you know, these weird ventriloquist dolls that he used to bring out and do little shows with. And so that aspect of fun, always, I always reflect on that. Um, in terms mm-hmm. of how can I create humor and fun? Um, and I think the final one is really just navigating my sexuality, to be honest, and mm-hmm. spending a lot of time trying to conform to society's norms of exploring relationships with men and then realizing mm-hmm. that actually when I was most alive and free was when I was in a relationship with a woman. And mm-hmm. navigating that for me was something that really shaped who I am today. Yeah, amazing. Chantelle? You know, I think it's the same as Gemma. It's like it's different seasons, but I think very early on realising that um, there were other people who needed my protection. So from a really young age, being able to step up, and I'm known as the Bikinji warrior in my community and always having the ability to stand up and fight for others, but also this courage to speak what was in my heart has um and being able to follow that that calling in my heart. So I've never really had a roadmap to get me to where I am today, but I've always had this ability to follow that calling. And I, it's more like a compass as opposed to having a roadmap because I'm I'm too many bloody firsts in my family. And it's not something that um, I'm proud of. It's something I'm proud of to break those cycles, but it's something I wish wasn't the case to be the first to finish school the the first to get a university degree and stuff like that. So I think for me, um, that ability to step up and I had to realise from a really young age that I had to help myself before I could help others. And in order to be a guide or a light for others, I first had to, there were so many people who would say something and then contradict themselves. Um, mm. like adults who, who would say, oh, you've got to, you've got to learn to work hard. And then you would actually sit back and watch them and go, well, you're not role modeling that. So from a yeah. really young age for me, it was about being what I spoke about. It was making sure that there was that credibility there and the truth that I was living the processes of the messages that I was sharing or wanting to give to others and that I had to help myself before I could help others because as an Aboriginal woman, as a woman, as a mother, we're all about the collective. We're all about looking after others first, but we're a part of the collective. And I lost my mum at 42 in, um, in our, in our communities. We're losing our elders at 50 and 60 before they even have a chance to become elders or to pass that knowledge on to the next generation. And it's, yeah. and it's because they're serving everyone else and there's just, there's so much going on and there's so much dysfunction that we're burning out earlier and earlier. So, for me, it's having the courage to go, I matter in that cycle as well. And I can serve from a cup empty. I know what it is. I can do it all the time, but it's not sustainable. And how much more powerful am I to my family, to my community when my cup is half full or it's sustained and the roots that um, support me are strong? But also, as, as Jim said, knowing your story and being able to handle and hold your own bullshit as well as your own potential, I think is so important in being able to show up and do the work to to create change in the world because um, we're bringing more and more humanity. There's a calling to bring humanity back to the workforce, back to the world, because what we're doing is not sustainable. Mm. So true. And it sounds as though the the moments in time and the lessons and and what you've seen happen they are the tipping points but they're also the ongoing lessons 
because they're the constant reminders along the way throughout the journey um, that continue to shape you, all of us, because even, you know, what Gemma has shared as well is, is of that similar nature that it's an ongoing shaping. It's not a, and then this happened and then the, I was the thing and then I stayed that thing forever. Um, Lillian, is there, I've actually heard let you speak on stage and so there are a few things I know about your story, but is there something specific that comes to mind for you? What's shaped me, uh, I mean, the many things that have shaped me, like you know, what Gemma and uh, Chantel have mentioned, but as a young adult, what played a big part, one of the things that played a big part is um, just the upbringing within the tribal context, <clears throat> my upbringing mm-hmm. in Kenya um, and within that tribal con- context and also having philosophies that I followed. Um, and that, for me, has had the biggest impact um, as a young adult for me. Um, being part of a tribe is incredibly special um, right now and even as a young adult. It's just incredibly special to be part of this group of people that you, where you share customs, you have, um, you have a shared ancestral lineage and traditions, so what that me- what that means for me now and what that meant for me as a young adult uh, then was that I just knew where I belonged. A strong sense of identity it was just, just very clear. I belong to this tribe and this is what it means to be part of this tribe. Um, I had, as a young adult, I had a really deep sense of connectedness with my fellow tribe members because we had a lot of shared experiences. Um, I... I also knew that the tribe would be there for me. Uh, we have something called Harambe, uh, which is basically a word from my native language, Swahili, that means joining together to achieve a common goal. Uh, Gemma, uh, Chantel talks, talks about that collectivist uh, approach that First Nations have, uh, and we are quite similar. And what how that plays out in our lives now and how it played out in my life then as a young adult is basically people just show up with what they have and contribute to the collective. It's about mm-hmm. common good. And yeah. that that sense of confidence as a young adult, knowing that people will be there and they will show up with what they have, whether it's about mm-hmm. raising money, raising kids, whatever it is, people would show up. And there was nothing too small or too big. Um, it was about showing up with your in your privilege and showing up in your lack and in your what, whatever you had in your hands. That is what you contribute. Uh, mm. and as a young adult, that gave me confidence, and it it gave me confidence to know that my contribution was important, and it gave me confidence that if somebody if I needed help, there would be people that would rally around me. Mm. And, um, it really set me up for my transition to Australia in 19 yeah. coming here as a student, studying psychology, knowing, knowing how the tribe operates, having that Harambe philosophy as one of the many things that influenced me, allowed me to come in and navigate this new landscape as a culturally diverse woman. Um, it, it also has given me the foundation to show up as I show up right now as a human being, as an adult to do the work that I do as a diversity and inclusion practitioner to deliver this amazing program with Gemma and, and Chantel on, and showing people how to become better together by really mm. helping them with a the conversational capability. It, um, it just, it's, it is, that's been the most powerful thing. And I'm so grateful to my ancestors for that, that the gift of the tribe and the philosophy mm. that they have imparted in, in, in my life. Wow. There's so many moments already that I'm like, oh, we could just stop there. That was amazing. <laughs> uh, Lillian, you, you said a word just then that I feel like I hear every day right now. Um, though it's complex and, and, and complicated in the world that we're in. Um, we, I feel like I'm constantly hearing this topic on diversity. And I feel like we're not quite there 
And there's still some significant challenges around having respectful and open communications um, that are with a diverse, diverse lens. So, Gemma, I'm going to throw to you with this one, with this world that we're in, we've got children around the same age by the sounds of it. Um, what do you think to be, you know, the co- common discussion points and and what do you think we need to be doing more of so we can be having better conversations around diversity and in these challenging environments? Ooh, how long do we have, Caroline? No pressure. Um, well, <laughs> can you fix it for us, please? Yes. I think the <laughs> – no, I can't. Um, but I think we can start, <laughs> right? So I think that you're right in the words that you used around, yep, yeah, it's complex. Um, but I think there are some things that certainly Lily and Chantelle and I talk about through the work that we do, which are that um, I guess part of the reason that we came together with this idea of how do we become – better together how do we stop having such an individualistic focus Mm. on some of these things and start to come together um you know in terms of sharing sharing you know the the common understanding sharing humanity and being in community with one another um you know how do we do that and um how do we become better humans to other humans right that's kind of what what we mm. all i think you know i assume positive intent with people and i think most people are, are good people and actually do want to be good to one another um mm-hmm. and so i think the first thing that we talk about is we need to stop shying away from conversations um just because we don't know the right answer because quite often there is no right answer um and that there are um, you know, multiple ways to understand someone's experience and, um, and so shying away from the conversations altogether isn't the answer. Um, so we really need to help people understand, um, give them some mechanisms and some tools to lean into these conversations with empathy. Um, and I think part of that is helping people to seek to understand, not to reply or respond, because um, that's what we see in the age of social media is, and don't get me wrong, I've, I've been caught up in this. I've, I've been sat there for hours on end, especially through lockdown, being like this keyboard warrior, like responding to people, that's not right, that's not true, you know, kind of going at people and attacking and attacking and attacking. Mm-hmm. And I know that some of that is through my own pain and, you know, wanting to wanting to be a great ally or, or just wanting to support my community and some of it's projecting my own experience around shutting down homophobia online. But you know yeah. what? I can't change those people's opinions by attacking them quite often. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this idea of how do we seek to understand um, one another and remain in conversation for as long as possible. Um, there's a concept we talk about in our program around the difference between being unsafe and uncomfortable and those mm. two concepts are really important things to know especially as a you know a young person is to know when you're unsafe and to know when you're uncomfortable Chantelle does a great mm-hmm. analogy around her jujitsu and being in an arm bar which I'll let her talk to but you know mm-hmm. there's a difference between being unsafe and uncomfortable um, and I think the other couple of things is are really around this idea that Lillian talked about and Chantelle around like how can we be here to improve community versus prove ourselves like improve humanity and community should trump the idea of proving myself and proving my point every single time. Yeah. So yeah. If we can go into conversations saying I'm here to try and improve community, to improve connection um, and to improve my own understanding rather than prove my point and prove myself, then I think we can get further along. Um, and I think the final point um, around this concept of what's needed for diversity and inclusion is actually there's, as much unlearning required as there is learning. Um, mm. You know, and part of what we help people understand through the work we do is what shaped you and what are some of the assumptions and norms that you believe are universal that actually are not. They're just your, they've just shaped you <laughs> and they're your view of the world and we're not here to criticise that. But what we're trying to help you understand is just because it's true for you doesn't mean it's a universal truth and that there are mm. other ways that people experience this world um, and so unlearning some of the unhelpful norms and assumptions that we've developed over time is also part of the process and I think there's a lot of work out there being done on 
how do we do new things in DNI and how do we add and how do we learn? But actually, there's not much talk or enough talk on unlearn- unlearning some of the things that are getting in the way of inclusion. Mm-hmm. I think it's really interesting that you say that, that last point, because though our community who are our listeners are all different ages and stages and seasons of their life, there, there's definitely a a purpose to this particular podcast to support our younger adults. But I think we underestimate how much even young adults need to unlearn because they have mirrored and mimicked and, um, you know, shadowed their, their parents, their guardians, their elders, their teachers, their coaches, their whoever is giving them, be it subtle or very direct influence in their life. And, you know, I, I, even I naively probably, looked at the concept of what we wanted to create for this particular podcast series and thought, yeah, let's teach them some of the things. But I hadn't even thought about the fact that we probably need to be open enough so they can unlearn some of the things and we can share even some of those embarrassing stories that we've shared so far or whatever else and go, hey, this is an opportunity to unlearn the fact that being embarrassed doesn't need to come with 20 years of carrying shame or whatever the scenario is. So, yeah, that's um, that's a really brilliant way of looking at it. I love that point about unlearning. Um, and I just wanted to add on to that. Um, and the importance of young adults to just to invest in the unlearning now before before they get to you know the, the older stages when it becomes really difficult. Uh, this, mm-hmm. So there's, this is the best time to do that. Um, and what I also wanted to call out is the importance of personal responsibility. No mm-hmm. one do the unlearning. It's only that person who. That person is to want it and be committed to the unlearning process. Uh, and mm. this is incredibly important in helping us create a, a better community. It's, it's incredibly important in helping us to be better together because change will only happen if every person plays their part. So uh, mm. that's, the, that's the call out to young adults. Do it now. Invest in the unlearning now. That is part of being better together. Mm, definitely. Now, Chantal, I know you have your hands busy with a bubba, which segues very well into my next question, so I'm hoping you can still unmute yourself. You are the mother of three children. You are currently caring. I can actually see you caring for your very, very small, tiny, fresh new baby. <laughs> um but as a mother of three, what skills do you believe um, young people need when it comes to having good conversations, let alone better conversations? Like some of them may be just harnessing some of these skills in their teens and early 20s. Uh, I've got five children, Carolyn. Um, oh, I've got a 14-year-old. Oh, that's right. Sorry, my apologies. No, you did okay. say that earlier in our discussion. I've just like no, counted two of them. That's okay. I've got, I've got 11-year-old twins. I've got a six-year-old kinship daughter. So um, in our community, we sometimes adopt um, our siblings' children as our own. And they may not always live with us, but she's my kinship daughter. And I have a three-week-old newborn son. Um, so... It's a really good question as to what skill sets to young people. They, first and foremost, they need adults in their lives who have the courage to, to role model that. Um, because first and foremost, the, the biggest thing I've learned being a parent is that it's not what you say, it's what you do that is the most important thing when it comes to your, your children. And my son, my youngest child is a boy. He is going to get a completely different parent, both culturally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and a, and a lived experience, um, growing up to what my three older children did. Cause I was 22 and 25 when I had my other children. And 
I was unlearning. But also there's this concept of decolonisation um, that's, that's mm-hmm. getting stronger within not just Aboriginal cultures but around the world as well, this process of going, hold on, Western culture isn't the only culture out there, but it's the most dominant one in um, uh, in in the world at the moment, especially in um, the industrialised world. And the fact that, hold on, you want to talk about sustainability, you want to talk about mental health and mindfulness and all this, why aren't we looking to the oldest living cultures in the world, not just First Nations culture, but cultures that have done community, that have done family, that have done living with the natural world since since their inceptions. Why are we mm-hmm. not letting go of the ego? Because we've got white males that are still the dominant ones in power, and yet we're ha- um, I'm expected as an Aboriginal woman to go and do cultural safety training for 20 CEOs, white males, and hold on, you're psychologically unsafe, so I need to create a safe space for you, but then when I finish that training, I can walk out of the room and pick up my phone and see that another young Aboriginal First Nations young boy has been put in jail. My son is more likely to go to jail than he is to finish school. My girls are more Mm -hmm. likely to end up um, victims of domestic violence than they are Mm -hmm. um, to finish school. So it's the courage to be able to handle the truth. It's the the courage to to know yourself but also to know your limitations. What are your Mm -hmm. what are your boundaries? What's your capacity and capability to be able to hold conversations and I think when we know ourselves and we and the things that we learn from our program so being able to hold your own story you're then able to hold space for others and you spoke about it yourself seeking to understand Mm -hmm. as opposed to to judge or even the ability to explain and that's something with in our in our program I mean in our program you've got a woman of African descent who's had all sorts of lived experiences. You've got Gemma, who is a queer woman who's come from England and a teenage mum. I'm a First Nations woman who is who is fair skinned, and you bring together mm. those those stories and those capabilities. And it was through our conversations that we came up and with this idea of the Better Together Collective. But mm-hmm. being able to sit in a space, especially at a corporate level, where it's more about productivity than it is about humanity. I think mm. young people, particularly going into these corporate careers and those and that corporate trajectory, is the mm-hmm. earlier they can learn to hold their own story and hold their own truth, will better equip them to be able to hold a space to understand others and difference. Yeah, that's so true. And not only will it equip them with their peers, but and the people that are closest to them, but when uh, the the fact that you've used corporate as an example is brilliant to me because that's often the pathway we're telling kids to take. We're telling them finish school, go to uni, get a job. Like we're still telling them that ridiculous story, even though I'm sure that the four of us have taken very different paths in very different directions and then back again and doubled over ourselves and whatever we've done. But we're still telling kids that. Um, we're still telling young people that. And we're telling them to fit fit in a box. We're telling them to squeeze themselves into the square-shaped peg and they can't know themselves and they can't even be comfortable with their own stories. So how can we continue to adjust that? And it's conversations like this and it's opportunities like this to hear that from a different mindset and to hear that framed in a different way to say you can actually be yourself and be really comfortable with your own story and all of the complexities that come with it be it even if you're only 17 because you've already done 17 years so acknowledge that I think the important thing is just to bring the point up is that Sometimes we don't know ourselves and then that's why we're deflecting or mm-hmm. we're, um, we're triggered by other people. And, and as Lillian pointed out earlier, the younger you can start this process, the better because as we get older, life gets busier. It's so easy to go, oh, it's too hard to do that. I've got a job, I've got a family, I've got a business, all that sort of stuff. But if we don't take personal responsibility for that process, how, um, how, do, we, how do we do that? when we can't sit with others, and especially with the the diversity of the world. Like Australia is a very, very multicultural country. It has been 
forever. So how mm-hmm. do we sit with difference? How do we, by first sitting with ourselves and being able to hold our own, basically, as I say, that hold our own bullshit, being able to sit and look into the mirror, then we can only sit with others in that same space and not be not be triggered and seek to deflect or, or run away from challenges. Mm-hmm. But that's that's a part of decolonisation. It's a part of going, hold on, this is what I've been told to do. Those are the steps. But where do I, as a businesswoman, how do I make sure that I'm serving my responsibilities by giving back to others, making sure that I'm not just taking, what am I contributing as well? These are things you need to be able to hold space for. And as you can hear my little goose in the background here. Yeah, I was going to say, there's, there's a baby in the background. If anyone's listening going, what's that extra sound I can hear? And being able to breastfeed as a mum and being able to to hold that space as a businesswoman going, at the end of the year I may be coming to Melbourne to deliver some workshops with, with Gemma and Lillian and bringing my baby into that space and going, I may have to stand up the front and facilitate while I'm breastfeeding now. Who's going to be uncomfortable with that? Me? Mm-hmm. The room? And it's mm-hmm. being able to have those skills and modelling them to young people to go, actually, this is the new norm that we want. Yeah, and it's all about that modelling, and and I guess that ties in with my next question for you, Lillian. As um as an immigrant myself, um I immigrated to Australia when I was quite young, um but you've talked you talked briefly just a moment ago about what your tribe had equipped you with with the skills and the support, be it verbally telling you that. Um, you had their support, but also whatever else came from the years that you have spent in your tribe. How have you found the the challenges to in, integrate into Australia? And and when it comes to young people who maybe have recently immigrated to Australia or have immigrated into a you know, English speaking Western colonized close-minded, often unsafe environment, is there is there something that you've found to be helpful when it comes to sharing those conversations? So as a as a Kenyan Australian, um, I have had to learn a lot of lessons in the last 22 years. Um, navigating life as a culturally diverse woman has been exciting and also very challenging. I came to Australia at the age of, I think, 19 or 20. And prior to that, I had about 20 years of, as I I mentioned before, growing up in the tribe, growing up with a large extended family. And um, I was part of the black majority group. And I moved to Australia to pursue my university studies, and my life changed suddenly. Um, Mm. All of a sudden, I was in the racial minority. And... Mm -hmm was not equipped to deal with that change. Yeah. I had understood colonization, given my country had been colonized by the British for many, many years, and, mm-hmm. and, and many other um, cultural groups came through, like the Arabs and the Portuguese. So colonization, I understood that. I, I heard stories from my family who were impacted directly by colonization. Um mm-hmm. I had to deal with inequity, oppression, their human rights being abused. Um, I also understood racism from an intellectual perspective as well, because studying racism in school, looking at what was happening in South Africa at that time with apartheid, um, understanding the history of slavery. Um, and then I had, came to this new world on my own, and I had my whole family, you know, they're all back in Kenya, and I had to create a life on my own. And mm. it was challenging. Um, I didn't really have any blueprint per se to show me how to navigate through life. Yeah. And I, I, I struggled for, for many, many years. Um, I, because I felt rejected by people through discrimination, whether it was racism, whether it was mm. racism or, uh, microaggression, because I felt rejected by others on a regular basis. I started rejecting myself, and this is what I talk about in my keynotes. I started masking my, my cultural heritage all of, all of a sudden was was an issue for me, and I tried yeah. to mask whatever I could so that I could belong. I was mm-hmm. my tribe, you know. Remember, I talked I talked about that sense of belonging. Yeah. I did not have that here, 
Mm-hmm. Many years of masking and carrying this burden of not showing up authentically and not embracing who I was, my health and well-being was impacted and I had to make a change. And in I think that was about 12 to 15 years ago, that was a turning point for me. When my relationships were compromised, my health and well-being was basically down the, down the toilet. And mm-hmm. I decided to go back to my origins, go back to my roots, go back yeah. to my go back to the philosophies that have influenced me all my life. And yeah. literally about finding, creating a tribe here that made sense for me. A tribe. Mm-hmm. That alignment. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And also applying things like Harambe, the Harambe philosophy that I talked to you about, looking at what I had in my power, what I had in my hands to contribute, to make a difference, mm-hmm. so that the society can be better together. And mm-hmm. years since making that change, I have intentionally shown up and contributed with my my knowledge, my expertise, my qualifications, my networks, um, and exercise that Harambe spirit over and over again. And that's what we do with this program, Becoming Better Together. It's really about us showing up and exercising the Harambe spirit so that people yeah. can create a culture of belonging and respect, not only in their organizations, but also in their community. So mm. for, my encouragement to young people is, Look at where you come from. Your your superpower can be the thing that you're also rejecting. For me, I rejected my cultural heritage mm-hmm. for the first time, yep. and now it's serving me. Uh, so look at that and and find ways to contribute uh, because your contribution is important to actually creating a humanity that we can be proud of in this century. Mm. Gemma, if you could give some advice to your 18 year old self, what would it be? Um, I think for me it would be, you know, don't fight your sexuality and instead um, explore it would be the first one. Mm. Um, I think this idea of get to know yourself before being so fixed on trying to fit in with others that you actually abandon, through the process you actually abandon the parts of you that, you love the most in service mm. of trying to fit into one of those boxes or one of those lanes that sort of society tells you to strive towards. Mm. Um, and yeah, it would be to, yeah, not abandon yourself in the process and actually get to know yourself. And, um, one thing that Chantelle said in one of our early interactions that has always stuck with me is this idea of belonging to yourself, you know, before you can belong to others. I reckon mm-hmm. I just spent so long trying to attach myself to others, like even in primary school, finding a group of friends. Like it's okay to just be on your own and enjoy your own company and have a few friends, not having the most friends and being popular. Like mm-hmm. I never even realized this concept of like belonging to myself and holding my own self-respect and boundaries. So, um, yeah, I think it would be to try and figure that out quite mm-hmm. early as well. What about you, Chantel? If you could give advice to your 18-year-old self, what would it be? So much. So much. <laughs> we don't have enough time. I, What's the top thing? <laughs> I think, like Jem said, belong to yourself first because as a woman, as an Aboriginal woman, as a mother, like I belong to so many different groups and so many different roles that I can – be pulled in so many different directions. So first and foremost, understanding yourself and all parts of yourself because mm-hmm. my darkness and my shadows are not my enemy. But if I don't learn to, to, to embrace them, they can, they can be my destruction and my downfall. Um, mm-hmm. It's sometimes it's about surrendering to the journey as it is rather than how you want it to be, which is something that I'm learning now and processing that, Particularly, I had a very difficult birth with my son, which is a completely different conversation. But um, something a psychologist said to me a few years ago, um, he said that I kept coming to him with the same problem. And it was about my family. It was, I love them. And every time I go home, I'm showing up for them, but no one's showing up for me. And he goes, maybe it's your unrealistic expectations of your family and situations that is causing you pain as opposed to the situations... Maybe it's about learning to love people for who they are rather than who you want them to be and then putting in place boundaries about your interactions with them. And 
I really took that away and applied it to my whole life experience and output. And it's about accepting reality for what it is and people for who they are and then working towards the reality that and the experience that I want to have with it with that person or that situation and finding the sweet spot in in the middle and a lot of that comes from self-love and being able to show up for myself because while I was grieving the people who didn't show up I wasn't celebrating or or acknowledging the people who did choose to show up and just listening to Lillian and Gemma and they're, they're, they're a part of the tribe that I wish that I'd had a lot earlier and that I wish that I had in person here. But every time we see each other and we gather, it's, I, they, they see me. I can show up in all parts of myself in what I don't know in business. I've never had a corporate career. I never feel less than in this group. And when that, that imposter syndrome comes up or that voice comes up, I can speak that truth in this space and um, and have them both go, uh-uh, not here. It doesn't need to be. <laughs> I can be seen, loved and valued and respected for who I am and what I bring to the table. And I think that's the other advice is find your inner circle of people that you can be seen and heard and loved but also held accountable as well, like people who can go hold you accountable to your own responsibility but also not hold you in, in judgment of that. I know that's a big tangent, but that question really no, I love I'm it. asking myself a lot right now while I'm in this space of um, just in between so many different spaces. Definitely. How about you, Lillian? You've talked a little bit about that time of your life, but would there be any particular advice you'd give to your 18-year-old self? Um, it, it's basically what Chantel said. Um, if you can create the tribe early, Create it now. This is the, this is the best time to do that. I lost a lot because it took me a while to create a tribe, the tribe that I have now. I was mm-hmm. not intentional, um, like Gemma, that sense of belonging and you know wanting to fit in. So I compromised a lot of values, my personal values. And um, so if I had the tribe that I had now, then I'd be in a very different space. So my encouragement would be. Be intentional about the tribe that you create. Curate, like literally, you know how an employer would go through that vetting process and before they hire you, um, or even just before you allow anyone to come into your house, you need to be safe, you need to know them. Just exercise intention and vet the people that, uh, that, w- that are part of your tribe. And if it's not working, uproot. Deal with that quickly because it, that can be also very toxic. I think that's really important. So intention about building the tribe and also seeing the tribe as a, a place that is sacred. It is a sacred space because in that tribe, it's like a well. I talked about that sense of identity, sense of belonging, all of the benefits that we enjoy in Africa being part of a tribe. You can enjoy the same benefits with a tribe that you curated yourself. And that is also your safe space where you can practice to have those conversations, those awkward conversations. It's your safe space to fail safely. And it's your safe space to practice until you have the confidence. So what we talk about in our program is we talk, we have a conversational framework that we show um, leaders and organizations and individuals on how they can apply that conversational framework to have better conversations. So mm. use your tribe to practice and then you can go out to the community and be better and show others on how that can be done. So I think it's just, that's my advice. Create your tribe and role model that for others so we can be better together. Well, on that note, I think that our listeners will not only, not a, regardless of what stage they are in their lives, there is a lot to take away from what we've discussed today a lot of easy things to implement and a lot of things that take a lot of personal work, a lot of that deep self-work that is what we're all supposed to be doing on the journey that is becoming an adult, becoming, you know, a, a better human, being better together and just doing life as we, you know, continue to do that with our growing pains. I thank you, all three of you, for your time today and to our listeners we look forward to sharing more with you on the next episode of Growing Pains 
So there you have it. Some really brilliant, insightful words from three powerhouse women who are well and truly working together to be better together. And in addition to that, have taken the insights of their journey, of their learnings throughout their lives in such different ways, like talk about three really different stories, all collectively of a similar thread in the sense of community, in the sense of identifying what works really well um, and sharing, you know, those last insights of what they would say to their 18-year-old selves. And I really hope that you have enjoyed today's episode and have taken some insights that you can implement potentially straight away, but also some underlying thoughts that can guide you as you continue to go through what what are the growing pains of life and and the growing pains of of every day and getting older and the constant evolution of us as humans. If you enjoyed today's episode, we would love you to leave us a review uh, and let us know through your podcast app that you are enjoying this series. Please pass it on to a friend. Uh, so there's m- many ways of sharing this. So you can share it on social media. Or just simply sending this podcast episode to a friend via a message and saying, hey, I heard this and I really think that you might gain something from it. Or oh, I just thought it was great. Uh, but definitely subscribe to make sure that you don't miss the next episode. And, uh, yeah, we... Thank you for your time today and hope that you, you know, get through tomorrow, today, whatever is next for you on the journey with a few less growing pains. <laughs>